Hi, I'm Alistair, and this is an escape room prop inspired by knife throwing circus tricks, which, as I learned myself while researching this video, are called impalement arts, where knives are thrown at a human target. Now, sometimes that target may be spinning around, as in a famous trick called the Wheel of Death. Sometimes the thrower might be blindfolded. But in this case, I've just drawn a simple outline of a person spread eagled on the board. You could instead strap a mannequin or tie a teddy bear in their place if you preferred. And you can see that there's a number of holes dotted around the board from previous throws. So, the objective of this puzzle is for players to insert these knives into the correct slots. Now, it doesn't matter what order they're inserted in, just that they are placed in the correct holes. So with three knives and 12 slots to choose from, that gives 220 possible combinations. So it's not going to be easy for players to brute force this. When the final knife is inserted in the correct hole, a sound effect plays, this lock is released, and players are able to claim their prize. So now let me show you how I made this and how you can build this prop yourself. The board is built from slats stripped from an old wooden pallet I picked up by the side of the road. Uh, I did that because it was free wood, it prevents it being sent to landfill, and I also think it gives quite an authentic aesthetic for a carnival game. So I drew the design on the front and then cut out the knife holes around the body using a jigsaw. And then I screwed these sensors onto the back of the board behind each of the correct slots. Now I just made a separate video about these. They're 3D printed mounts that house the components for a beam brake sensor. So there's a transmitter unit on one side of the hole and that has an infrared LED that's pointing across the slot. Then there's a receiver unit on the other side that's pointing back towards the transmitter. So normally the receiver unit can see the infrared light from the transmitter and that outputs a high signal on this white output line here. When a knife is inserted into the hole though, it blocks the light from the transmitter and that means that the signal from the receiver drops to zero volts instead. Now, if you don't have a 3D printer, that doesn't matter. You can screw or glue these in place instead, but using the mount will help make sure they're aligned to the hole and point directly at each other without wobbling around. Now, to detect when all three of the correct slots have been obscured with the knives inserted, these sensors are wired to an ESP32 down here, which also controls the audio output and releases the mag lock around the front. So let me show you how that's wired up. So starting with the inputs up at the top here, on the left hand side I've got the transmitter units for the beam brake sensors. And these are really very simple. They're basically just an infrared LED that's constantly on. Uh, they've already got a series resistor built into them, so you can just wire them directly to ground and to 5 volts or 3.3 volts will work fine too. Now, I've shown them here sharing a common power line with the ESP32, but that's not required. They don't have any electronic interaction with any of the other components, so they don't need to be part of the same circuit at all. You could even power them from a, a separate battery up here if you wanted to. And then opposite each transmitter, we've got the corresponding receiver unit. And again, uh, these are wired to ground and to 3.3 volts, except these also have a third wire in the middle, which is the output signal. And I'm taking these to three GPIO pins on the SP32. I'm using pins 4, 5 and 15, but there's nothing particularly special about those. You can use any available GPIO input pin. So that is our inputs. Now let's take a look at the outputs. Over here I've got my MP3 audio player. And this is controlled by a serial interface. So it has two wires, one for carrying commands from the ESP32 to the audio player, and another for sending information from the player back to the controller. So I've connected the transmit pin from the ESP32 down this green wire here 
to the receive pin of the player and then I'm taking the transmit pin from the player back to the receive pin of the ESP32. Now I'm using the secondary UART interface that's built onto the ESP32 and that uses pins 16 and 17 by default but you can actually reassign that to use any available GPO pins you want. If you're using an Arduino board that only has one hardware serial interface you can instead set up a software serial emulation on any other pair of GPO pins available instead. Now you also need to check that these dip switches on the audio player board are put into the correct position to set it into a serial interface mode. So switches 1 and 2 need to be set to off and the third switch needs to be set on. Now one of the reasons why I like these audio boards compared to other mp3 modules like the DF player is that they have a decent built-in amplifier so you can connect a speaker directly to them without needing to run the audio output to a separate amp. Now to power that amp it also means that they need a separate power supply. So this is the DY-SV8F module and that outputs uh, 5 watts of sound. So to do that you need to supply a 5 volt DC power supply here. Now if you want even beefier sound than that, you can use its big brother, which is the HV20T board instead. Now that can deliver up to 20 watts of output. To do that you have to supply a DC input here of somewhere between uh, 6 and 35 volts, I think it is. So depending on the volume output and the exact uh, audio player board you're using, you just need to adjust this DC input here to provide sufficient power for the amplifier. And then finally at the bottom here we've got our relay module which is controlling the maglock here. So this is a 5 volt relay module, it's connected to 5 volts and ground and it also has a signal line that's connected to a GPIO pin, I'm using pin 13. And when a high or a low signal is written from the ESP32 to that wire it is going to cause the relay module to energize and switch between either the normally closed or the normally open connection. When it does that, it's going to cause this circuit here from the 12 volt DC supply here to either be make or break the connection through to the maglock. And that's going to cause the maglock to either release or to lock. So when the puzzle has been solved, what the ESP32 is going to do is write a signal to this pin here. That causes the relay to switch state and that makes or breaks this connection here to the maglock. And this is the code that's running on the ESP32 that is controlling that logic. So starting at the top, I'm including one external library which you can download from here. And that contains the commands that allow us to interface with the audio player. Then we move on to a section of constants. So these are variables that define how we've got the hardware configured, but they're not going to change their values throughout the lifetime of the code, so they are described as constant. So I'm using three sensors, but you can really use as many different sensors as you want, so long as you've got sufficient available GPIO pins to read their value. And the GPIO pins I'm using are pins 4, 5 and 15. I'm also using pin 13 as the output that's going to control the relay when the puzzle is solved. Let me move on to the global variables. The first global variable is an array of Boolean values which are called last sensor state. So I'm going to keep track not just of the current value of each of the beam break sensors but of the last known value as well and that's going to let me know whether a knife has been inserted or removed. We're going to keep that value for each of the sensors so it's an array of boolean values that contains num sensors elements and I'm going to call that the last sensor state. Then we're going to initialize an object from the DY player library, which I included at the top, and we're going to initialize that using the secondary serial interface here, serial 2. 
I'm also going to keep an overall variable to describe the current state that the controller is in. So are we initializing? Have we just powered up? Is the puzzle currently running and is active? Or has it been solved? And to start with at least, we are just in the initializing state here. Then we go on to the setup function. Setup is called when the device is first powered up. And the first thing we do is initialize a serial connection. Uh, that's not actually used for the puzzle controller tool. It's not used as part of the game. It's just used to output information through the serial monitor, which is useful for uh, debugging when you're first setting the puzzle up as well. And for sending output messages like this so that we can see where the script is currently up to. Now serial 2, that is our secondary serial interface and that is the one that's going to be used to control the audio player. So as I mentioned I'm using pins 16 and 17 for that and these audio players require a baud rate of 9600 bits per second which we declare in the constructor there. We begin the interface to the player by calling the begin method on the player object and we just set a few configuration variables as well. So I set the play mode to be one off. In other words, when we trigger a sound effect, we just want to play it once and then stop. We don't want it to loop around. We'll set a volume to be a mid range value. That can be a range from 0 to 30. So we'll set it bang in the middle. And also, I'll just call the stop method just to make sure that the player is not currently playing any audio. I once had an issue with one of these players where I had previously been running some other code on it that was looping a file and then when I started using that player in a different setting when that player first received power again it continued the loop from where it got to so just to make sure that doesn't happen I explicitly call the uh, stop method here that's going to stop any playback in the setup function. We initialize all of the input pins that are going to the beam break sensors as inputs and we initialize the output pin that's going to the relay module as an output and we write a low value to that in its initial state. And then now that we've got to the end of the setup function we can change the state variable which we had said was initializing at the beginning here. We are now no longer initializing, we have got into the running state of the game. Next we get onto a utility function called print state and as its name suggests, what this does is it loops over all of the sensors and it simply prints the last known state to the serial monitor. And as I said, this is just a really useful way of either debugging any behavior when you first set the puzzle up, if you're not quite sure if the sensors have registered a knife being inserted correctly or not, what you can do is call this function and that's going to print a comma separated list of either one or zero values for each sensor that you're using just to let you know whether they have been triggered or not or whether they detect an obstruction across the slot. Um, then we go to another function called the isSolve function and this returns a boolean value so a true or false to let us know whether the puzzle has been solved or not. Well, How do we determine that? Well once again we loop over all the sensors and this time we look through the last sensor state array and instead of simply printing the value we check whether any of the elements in the last sensor state array are equal to 1. Now 1 is what the receivers output when they are able to detect the infrared light that's being sent from the transmitter unit. In other words there is no obstruction in the way so no knife has been inserted. So if we look over the last sensor state array and if any of the elements in that array are equal to 1 that means that we know that at least one of the sensors has not been obstructed. One of the knives has not been inserted in the correct slot and that means that we know that overall the puzzle has not been solved. So we can return a false in answer to the question is it solved. If instead we go all the way through this loop, we go over every sensor and every value in the last sensor state array and we haven't discovered a one value, that means that the puzzle has been solved, every sensor has correctly been obstructed and we return a true from this function instead. Now this is called from the loop function which is what we now go on to next. 
So this is the main program loop that just iterates over and over for as long as power is applied to the device. And on every iteration through the loop, what do we do? We loop over all the sensors. We use the digital read function to read the current value at the sensor pin that corresponds to that sensor. And we store that in a temporary variable that we we'll call sensor state. Then what we'll do is we'll compare the reading we've just taken, that sensor state reading, we'll compare that to the last known sensor state for this sensor that we stored in the array here. Now if it's different, so you see the inequality symbol here, if that is true that means it's changed since last time. Either it wasn't obstructed and now it is, or it was obstructed and now it isn't, so a knife has been inserted or removed. And if that's the case, what do we need to do? Well, first thing we need to do is we need to update our array so that we're looking at the correct updated values the next time. Then we'll call that print state utility function defined above. That's just going to help us read the current values of all of the sensors so we can see what's going on visually. And then the next thing to happen, the behavior is going to be slightly different depending on what state the puzzle is currently in. If the puzzle is currently running, or in other words, it's not solved at the moment, players are still inserting knives in and out and they haven't got the correct solution yet. But now when we call the is solved function, this returns true. That means that we know one of the sensor values has just changed. We know that because of this statement up here. And what we now know is that the puzzle is now solved. So in other words, they've just inserted the last knife correctly. If that's the case, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to play a sound effect, so we'll call the play specified method on the audio player object. This takes an index number that corresponds to the MP3 or WAV file that you want to trigger from the audio player. So I'm going to play the second file, which is, uh, I, I basically uploaded a number of different sound effects. I wasn't sure which one was going to work uh, best in this case, so that's the second file. You could put one or five or however many you want on the card instead. We also want to release the maglock. So what we do is we toggle the state of the relay pin. It was low before. Now we'll set it to be high. And we'll also update the state of the puzzle to say, okay, now it has been solved. So it's set to the solved state. If instead, however, the puzzle had been solved previously, but as a result of a recent change, it is no longer solved. What that means is that one of the knives that was in the correct position before has now been removed. And what does that mean? Well, it essentially, this is a way to reset the puzzle. Once players have finished and left the game, if you remove any of the knives from the board, you want to reset it back to the default state. And to do that, well, it's actually very simple. All we need to do is to relock the lock again. So to do that, we go back to writing a low signal to the relay pin. And if you recall, that was the value that we set right back in the uh, setup function at the top here. This is the default state when the mag lock is locked anyway. And we set the state of the puzzle controller back to be running again. And now your puzzle is reset and it will carry on running just as normal as it was before. So that just about brings me to the end of this build. I hope you found this video useful and informative, and I hope you find this a relatively straightforward project that you can implement in different ways in your own escape room scenarios. The knives I'm using have a simple rectangular cross section, but one way you could adapt this puzzle is to create slots of different shapes that match objects with different profiles. And obviously this doesn't have to be circus themed, I just thought that was a kind of a fun implementation. As always, I want to say thank you so much to my generous Patreon supporters who enable me to create these tutorial videos each month. I'll be uploading the resources and the downloads related to this project over onto my Patreon account and I'll put a link in the description below. So please do head over there if you'd like to know more about this or any of the other escape room projects I've made in this channel. And other than that, I just want to say thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again next time. Okay, cheers, bye.